Okay, welcome again. Here we are in our sixth lecture on love and sexuality. And today we will talk about Aristotle more. We talked about Aristotle in a previous lecture where we had a more general overview of what Aristotle in general wants and how his Nicomachean ethics um, generally sees the relationship between virtues and phronesis and eudaimonia. So if you uh, have not uh, seen the previous part, you should, because without that you will not understand this. So now today here we want to talk a little more about specifically Aristotle's um, theory of love uh, and friendship. And this is what we will we'll be uh, going into now. So first, before we begin, an introductory remark, you know, if you want to locate quotes in Aristotle, I will give you later, perhaps in particular pieces of the lecture notes, you will find um, quotes and you will have a source for the quote, which is a number, something like 1126b. And now what do you do with that? So the thing is that Generally, you don't quote classical sources from books with normal book pages of your edition because people are not likely to have this book. Obviously, Aristotle's or Plato's or even Kant's um, books have been published hundreds of times, thousands of times, with totally different font sizes, totally different page sizes, and therefore in, in different translations also, which would again be of different length sometimes. And so when you say something like uh, page 53, I would need to have exactly the same book like you have so that you are able to find page 53. This is not likely. It's difficult to locate exactly the same edition, while it's easy to locate some version of Aristotle. And so what is the solution to this problem? Um, people have said, okay, let's put markers into the text. Let's just number pages or paragraphs inside the text and have a number that is part of the text, that is displayed in the text along with the text. And this will be printed in the books. Uh, no matter how your book has uh, its pagination, there will always be 1123b somewhere as part of the text. So now if I'm looking for 1123b, I can just, you know, go through the book and see where it is. And even better, uh, when we have text that is electronic, then we can directly search for these markers because they are part of the text. You can just use your normal text search function in your PDF viewer or if you have the text on a website, you can search the website or sometimes you have specific tools that allow you to search for these uh, places. So here you have a very good source for Aristotle is this uh, Perseus um, website which gives you many ancient texts, not only Aristotle, it also contains Plato, it contains all kinds of people, uh, both in Greek and in translation. So this is wonderful because you have in the same interface, you have the Greek, you have the translation, you can look them up. You just click on this. Uh, if you don't have the clickable version of the lecture notes, then just you know enter the first uh, here, the uh, host name is easy to type. Just ignore the rest and from there you know navigate to find your place. So I will show you how this looks. If I click on that, uh, this will look like this. Okay, this is what you get. <clears throat> Specifically here we are at 1126a and I can now just enter any other number, let's say 1132a or something. I don't know what place this will be. This is something. Okay, whatever. Um, and there are different books. You see, there are well, the Homeric books. Odyssey is here. There is, um, you can find Agamemnon in there. You can find all kind of, of other books and and other hits inside other books. Okay, here you have some more um, uh, navigation, Greek and Roman material. So you can go up and find more Greek and Roman authors. Um, and so you can navigate beautifully within this text. You can also just jump directly up here uh, we have the pages as little boxes 
So if you know I want to go about a third of the book further, you can use this here or go directly to a particular page up here without searching for it. Okay, so this is uh, how you deal with these numbers. Okay, you ideally nowadays you just open your browser, go to Perseus, uh, enter here uh, the number that you find as a um, citation in the text, and then you uh, find. Um, what it says. And also now if you have the English here you can always click here Greek it says and here focus. So you click on this focus and then you get the same place in Greek. And now you can do other nice things. You can for example click on a particular word Tyrannos and then you get um, what kind of grammatic form this is. This can be sometimes very important when you try to understand a sentence, is it active or passive, to know what this is. This is not always right, but it, it's often right. And then you can also click on a dictionary, on a lexicon, and see what the word actually means. Uh, so here's what Teranos means. Um, and you can now, this opens in a second tab, so you still have your original tab up here uh, onto which you can click to go back and then if you s the Greek has now been replaced with English here on the side so if I click on the focus for English then I will go back to where I was to the English okay so this is uh, this is an excellent tool you should use that um, because it is a really good way to navigate these texts and to even uh, try to look up words in Greek and to understand what's happening. So even with a little Greek, uh, you don't need to speak fluently Greek. If you know the alphabet, uh, then you can already read some words like tyrannos, tyrant. You know, this is not difficult to read if you know the alphabet. So it, it's a good investment if you want to deal with ancient philosophy <clears throat> to at least learn the Greek alphabet, uh, how it works. And then you are able to look up particular words. And if you have tools like this, you can look up the words, you can look up the sentence, and you can puzzle it out. It's not, Greek is not a completely foreign language. It is related, <clears throat> obviously, to modern Greek. It is related to Latin. Um, it is, re it is uh, very similar sometimes grammatically to German. Uh, English is a little further from it, but uh, still it is possible if you have some knowledge of European languages to puzzle together a Greek sentence by just looking up the translations. Um, and it's worth it. Uh, sometimes uh, you can clarify questions about what people are saying because the translations are not always very good. So when you have a specific question about a specific word, it's better to ignore the translation and try to make your own or, or use the translation as a, as a rough approximation, but then try to find out the details yourself. Okay, so this is uh, um, how you use these tools. Um, that's it. We're finished with that. So now let's go... Uh, back to Aristotle. So uh, you remember what we said last time, you have virtues. These virtues, good qualities of character that benefit yourself and others, are moderated by your phronesis, your practical wisdom, in a way that allows you uh, in time with experience to reach a state called eudaimonia in which eudaimonia you have the best possible human life of course this is an ideal end point right no nobody of us has reached eudaimonia in this way but we are on the way there and um, when you are progressing towards eudaimonia you have a life that is increasingly um, morally good happy and successful and now you know these things about Aristotle. So now perhaps it would be a good idea to think a little. Uh, from what you know about Aristotle, try to guess what his opinion on love might be. Uh, perhaps stop the video here for a moment. Um, think about it. And then we come back and I will tell you. Okay, I hope you had a good thinking. Um, so now, every virtue we know results from moderation between the extremes of lack and excess. Right? You have too little and too much. You have too little courage is being a coward, too much courage is being reckless, and so on. This is true of all virtues. And so Aristotle very much emphasizes this um, 
moderation thing where all your virtues have to be present in just the right amount. This is not always the middle amount, but it's the just the right amount for this situation that will bring maximum benefit to yourself and to others. So love also should exist in moderation. Too little love, then you are heart hearted or something unkind again right like like scrooge perhaps or too much love aristotle would say interestingly this is what happens perhaps with young people who are um very much in love and very much into this uh, erotic side of love this is a kind of excess so sexual love for aristotle is a kind of excess and the um, really good love is again the moderate love is the kind of love that is between indifference and sexual excess so the point of all virtues is that they are based on rational evaluation of the right amount when rationality is affected or the virtuous exercise becomes irrational it's not a virtue anymore right aristotle puts a great effort great uh, emphasis sorry great emphasis into rationality um, so your virtues should be controlled by your rationality. Indifference to others is a lack. Sexual eros is an excess because it clouds your rational mind. When you are, you know, driven by your sexual urges, then uh, you cannot think clearly. So the optimal level of love is in between. And, and how would we call this? We would call it companionship. We would call it friendship. Clear-eyed, rational friendship serving the benefit of both the lover and the beloved. You see how friendship and eros are connected for Aristotle, right? It's not like these are different things. Friendship is a kind of love that is rational, clear-eyed, balanced, symmetric, while eros, um, erotic love, sexual love, is a love that is too much. It's a kind of excess in loving, which is not as good because it is too much in the same way like being reckless is too much courage so the ultimate goal of human life we remember is eudaimonia so love has to serve eudaimonia happiness of all participants if your love is not serving your eudaimonia you're doing it wrong because the point of all life is eudaimonia you are in love aristotle would say because ultimately you want to be happy if love makes you unhappy, if love takes you away from your demonia, there's no point in loving, right? Love is also like uh, wealth, is a thing that you want to have in order to be happy, right? We want to love in order to be happy. We don't want to be happy in order to love uh, if it makes us unhappy. So the ultimate goal is always to be happy for Aristotle, to be your demon. So love has to serve your happiness. Overly emotional love that makes people unhappy is not the right thing. So imagine a love movie where people are, you know, crazily in love and uh, suffering. <coughs> suffering because of this love. This kind of thing is a bad passion for Aristotle <coughs> rather than a good virtue, uh, which should be exercised with phronesis. <coughs> now, the thing is, we need friends. Why do we need friends? We need friends in order to learn phronesis and progress towards eudaimonia. <laughs> the idea is that you remember how to acquire phronesis. The, the thought was that when you want to acquire phronesis, you need input from experience, but you cannot make all the experiences yourself. So part of your input uh, that increases your phronesis are the experiences of your friends. So your friends share the experiences with you. Also, your friends give you an opportunity to exercise your virtues <laughs> you can be patient with your friends <coughs> you can be helpful to your friends you can be kind to your friends um, you can have courage uh, or other virtues you know honesty towards them and so friends are very important because they are both you profit from their phronesis and on the other hand you practice their virtues on them so you need to select your lovers or your friends with this in mind that you want to improve your phronesis and this will exclude some of them if the lovers are close to you in terms of phronesis then they might be more helpful to you because you can exchange more experiences with them 
A criminal being friends with a saint won't make for a mutually useful relationship, probably. It depends, it could be, right, in special cases, but generally the saint would perhaps profit more from the company of another saint who is slightly better than him or slightly worse uh, than him. If he is slightly better, our saint can learn from the slightly better friend. If he is slightly worse, our saint can teach the other saint to become better and thus he will also improve through teaching. <coughs> And the same applies to old, young, educated, uneducated, and so on. <clears throat> so all these friendly relationships for Aristotle profit from um, some closeness of the partners in terms of virtue, right? Or, or in terms of other properties. So a very old and a very young man have little to discuss. Perhaps they are so different in Phronesis that uh, it is unlikely that the relationship will be mutually beneficial. They, they might, the young one might benefit much more than the old one in this case. So in order to make it mutually beneficial, it is better if you have people who are closer, they're both middle-aged or they're both old or they're both young. And uh, so the Aristotle's relationship are based on this idea of the mutual usefulness and the lovers have to be roughly equal in phronesis so that the relationship benefits both of them. Otherwise, it's a teacher-student relationship, but it's not love and it's not friendship. Okay, real friendship cannot exist between teacher and student. This might be, you know, sympathy, or it might be, you know, I don't know, pity, depending on how good the student is. But um, it, friendship and love uh, exists uh, for Aristotle, for Aristotle, mostly between equals. And now Aristotle calls this thing philia, and this philia. Um, can mean different things. It doesn't mean precisely the same as English friendship. Philia means a kind of friendship, but includes, for example, also the feelings one has towards one's family. So it's more generally friendliness, perhaps, than friendship. Friendliness or loving care, loving attraction. The feelings towards people we share interests or hobbies with. This is a much looser term now, right? So when I go to a meeting of my hobby railroad group, then these people are my friends in a loose way. Um, I have a philia towards them. I have a, a relationship that is based on friendliness, uh, exchange of <coughs> of information about model railroads, about um, things that interest us. Um, but I don't need to be personally friends with them, right? It's enough if we have an interest, um, practical interest. And also business relationships. If I have a customer, then he being my customer um, creates a relationship of philia. I am friendly towards my customer. He is friendly towards me. We share an interest. He wants to buy my thing. I want to sell my thing. And therefore, we, we share this relationship of philia, right? So it's not only friendship. It's more. It's much more. It's much wider. Young lovers have philia. Lifelong friends have philia. Partners, cities can have philia. Business contacts, parents and children, fellow voyagers. You meet someone on a boat um, and you have to cross, you know, to the other um, uh, country across the sea. You have perhaps three, four days on the ship uh, in which you are together. So you, you take your meals with these fellow voyagers. <coughs> these people become, in a sense, your friends. You have a friendly disposition towards them. Um, you exercise your virtues towards them, you share a common interest to arrive at this other place, you share uh, the experience of traveling. So this makes you already kind of uh, creates a relationship of, of friendship in a, in a very wide, very uh, diluted sense, right? Members of the same religious society, business owners and their customers and so on. <clears throat> And particularly, you know, Aristotle says the friendship of children to parents and of men to gods. Now here now I gave you a different uh, kind of um, uh, citation. So instead of giving you the number in the Nicomachean Ethics, I give you this just to make sure you know how to read it. NE is the Nicomachean Ethics and the Nicomachean Ethics is um, 
uh, divided into books. So here is book eight. I hope you can read Roman numbers. If you cannot, then it's best to learn it because you will use them throughout your life uh, in academic context, especially with classic studies. These things appear very often and you can learn them in 10 or 15 minutes. So go learn how to write no Roman numbers. So this is a five and three is eight, okay? Book eight, uh, and then you have a page number here. Um, yeah, so this is how this works. We could now go back to the Nicomachean Ethics. Here's book eight, and this has, you know, sub uh, books, sub, um, uh, they, are, they are not books, they are, you know, like uh, articles perhaps inside this book. And so here we want this article 12 inside section 12, section we should perhaps say, section 12 within book 8. <clears throat> okay, uh, we're not going to look this up now, you can do it yourself. So you see that this is quite a bit more than what the English word friendship means. Friendship, uh, Aristotle says in 8.3, another way of quoting it, um, so 8 again means book 8 and 3 means section 3. Friendship is a relationship in which persons similarly love each other and in which they reciprocally wish good things to each other in that very respect in which they love each other. This needs a little unpacking perhaps. Um, similarly love each other. So this means it is a symmetric relationship. You cannot love somebody who doesn't love you back, then you don't have a friendship. Um, you, you need It needs to be mutual. And reciprocally, again, the one and the other, wish good things to each other. So you wish good things to your friend and he wishes good things to you in that respect in which they love each other. So this this last thing, I think, is supposed to mean that um, you, if you have a business uh, associate or a customer, you love each other, you know, you are friendly to each other in this customer relationship. And when I wish good things to you, I wish good things to you in the respect in which we love each other as customers or as, as businessmen and customer or something like this, right? Business owner and customer. So uh, I don't need to wish you good things for, you know, your uh, marriage or the welfare of your children. I need to wish you good things uh, that in the way that is related to this business owner and customer relationship, okay? So the, the good wishes are, um, kind of limited to the domain in which our friendship takes place. Because you remember Aristotelian friendships are not friendships. They are relationships that include business relationships, traveling. If I travel with you, I have to wish you good things related to our travel. I don't have to necessarily wish you good things related to your future um, uh, welfare or something like this. And now we need to remember that Eros, Platonic Eros, is an asymmetric relationship. Uh, also ancient Greek Eros, not only Platonic, but generally ancient Greek Eros uh, is asymmetric. The older Eros Tes and the younger Eros Menos don't love each other similarly. This is how their friendship differs from Eros. So Aristotle's friendship differs from Eros in that it is a symmetric relationship. In the rhetoric, Aristotle says, Philia is wanting for someone what one thinks good for his sake, for his sake, for someone's sake, and not for one's own, and being inclined, so far as one can, to do such things for him. So it's more than just wishing, it's a, it's a more practical wishing that actually, as far as one can, wants us to do the things for him that we wish to happen to him. So it's, it's otherwise it would be very superficial, right? I wish you, <coughs> I wish that you find a pen to write down your lecture notes, uh, but I have two pens and I don't give you one. Then this is not a good friendship. So as far as it's possible, as far as one can, I am supposed to help you achieve your goals, and then I'm a friend. 
But of course, there's some limits and and very you know um, sensible limits because if I'm a businessman, uh, you know, let's say I'm, I'm selling cars and you want to buy a car, of course I wish you to get a car. Uh, I also wish that you get it from me. I, I would very much love to give you the car that you want, but you do have to pay it. So I cannot. Uh, make you a present and, and give you my car for free because this is the point of being a businessman is that I have to sell you my car because I need the income. So uh, I am inclined as far as I can to give you the car, but I need the money so I cannot give you the car for free. Right? This is the point. So as far as one can, this gives some, some reality check to this friendship. Right, As far as I can, I have to uh, help you pursue your goals, but I'm not required to help you do whatever you like. <clears throat> uh, John Cooper, uh, here you see in a, in a paper, wrote, the central idea of Ilya is that of doing well by someone for his own sake, out of concern for him, and not, or not merely, out of concern for oneself. This, this is the same thing as before, right? It uh, unpacks it a little more um, explicitly. <clears throat> Aristotle says that philia is necessary for happiness since all men need friendship. So you cannot really be happy for Aristotle if you um, have no friends. <clears throat> there are various reasons for this. We will see in a moment why. <laughs> Aristotle thinks that we value a person only because of their goodness or usefulness. This now is a very strong claim, actually, right? It's a very strong claim of appraisal type relationships. I value a person only because of their goodness or usefulness. I don't value people that are not good and they're not useful, with one exception that he mentions, which are the children, my own children, which are perhaps neither good nor useful, but I still value them. But every other human relationship is based on goodness or usefulness. For not everything, he says, seems to be loved, but only the lovable, and this is good, pleasant, or useful. Good, pleasant, or useful. There are two ways in which someone may be good or pleasant. Someone may be good or pleasant in his own right, or someone may be good or pleasant in relation to me. So it's my good he's furthering. It's my pleasure he is creating. Or he may be good and pleasant in his own right. Someone is good in his own right if he is a good human being. If he is virtuous, acting according to the virtues and so on. That is, if he is a person with phronesis. People with phronesis, you daemon people, people who are successfully morally good and happy, are good in their own right. To love such a person is pleasant and valuable in itself, independently of who I am or what I want. Because it's always good for everyone to, to associate with people and to love people who have phronesis, because then it is good for you because you learn your phronesis also better. A complete friendship then is a friendship in which this sort of love is reciprocated. If you find someone who is a good person and you love him because of his goodness of character and he loves you because of your goodness of character, then you have this ideal complete friendship. A complete friendship, both friends are good, virtuous, sovereign human beings. Now, some other people are useful or good in relation to you. They are useful to you. Others are pleasant in relation to you. They are entertaining to you. Someone may be useful, of course, without being entertaining or entertaining without being useful, right? We all know such people. Um, uh, some, the, your, your doctor, right, who helps you when you have broken your arm is, is useful to you. But he is perhaps not very entertaining, um, but he is useful. Um, and other people are entertaining without being useful. You might have, um, you know, kind of... Um, person you you find very funny when you talk with him uh, he, he doesn't do anything useful uh, in your life um, but you're just entertained by him um, so this these two relations then define two further kinds of friendship uh, friendships based on usefulness and friendships based on the shared entertainment and pleasure 
So can we give an example to show how these two types of friendship are really distinct? Remember, usefulness and entertainment and pleasure. Think for a moment and try to find some examples of your own. Stop the video here and then we continue after you've thought a little about it. Okay, so if you are involved in a traffic accident, you might help them and they might help you. Usefulness, but you may not like them at the same time. Usefulness does not need liking. Or a friend who tells good joke might be pleasant to have around, but otherwise not useful to you, is what we just said. Okay? Same with the shopping. The people who sell you something in a shop are useful to you, but they don't become your friends. So now, how is Aristotle's philia different from our modern English friendship? We already said we would only call complete friendship a real friendship. We would not accept friendship for usefulness as genuine friendship at all. Friendship for pleasure would be somewhere in between, a weak form of sympathy from amusement, but not real friendship either. So in Aristotle's view, do now similar or dissimilar people become friends? What would you say? You remember we already briefly mentioned that. There are different ways how you can answer that, right? Remember that for Aristotle, friendship is symmetrical. That is, the love of one friend answers to the love of the other in roughly equal ways. Therefore, friends will tend to be similar in character and virtue. Ancient Greek, pederasty, which means the eros for the pedes, which are the children, uh, the young people. So eros for young people, the sexual love between old and younger men, is not a symmetrical relationship. Therefore, the two parts will not be able to fully relate as equals to each other, and their relationship will be unstable and not a true friendship. The older man will not be able to love the virtue in the younger, and the younger will not be able to love the body of the older. And so in this way, um, they are not going to have a complete friendship. They are, Aristotle says they are bound to be disappointed eventually by this. Complete friendship is based on good character, so only good persons can be friends in a complete friendship. But this does not matter as much for other kinds of friendship. For example, I can be entertained by someone or find him useful despite the fact that he is not a good person. So now, can we love things? For example, wine. What would Aristotle say? Can I say I love wine? Think about it. I can talk of loving wine, but I cannot be friends with wine. Why not? Because Aristotle's love is reciprocal. So I have to expect the wine to love me back. Right? Friends wish each other mutually good things. So if I love the wine, I expect the wine to love me back, which it cannot do. Also, philia for Aristotle means to wish the other well, but we cannot wish the wine well. What, what does it mean? Oh, wine, oh, tea here, my tea. I wish you well. How, how do I do this? How do I wish you well? Huh? What does it mean to wish the tea well? It doesn't mean anything. We can only wish that it keeps well or that it tastes well so that we can keep it to ourselves and, and enjoy it. But this then is not friendship. It's uh, furthering my own good um, uh, not you know doing anything for the tea or for the wine therefore no true love friendship is possible towards things the talk of loving wine is wrong and is not meant to be taken seriously as a kind of metaphorical expression that is not meant seriously okay so let's uh, for the moment finish here this explains briefly what aristotle wants how aristotle sees love and uh, we will talk more in the next video about the relationship between Plato and Aristotle and other aspects of Aristotelian philia that we can think about. See you in a moment.